Hi all, Mess Barnkop from Casa Power Electronics here. And what I have in my hands here is the world's most light sensitive device, which is a photo multiplier tube. This comes from the Fujifilm PCR Eleva teardown video. And this is part three, the final part, where we are going to reverse engineer how this high voltage power supply and signal amplifier of the photo multiplier tube works and we're going to do some particle detection with it. I have stripped down the entire assembler here and that's because this very nice piece of acrylic plastic here there is actually no real practical use for this afterwards so yeah for now this is just going to the side. Now this is a Danish channel so we must not forget the hygge and hygge is drinking some coffee when doing electronics. What we have here is the static and radiation tube shield, which basically just shields the tube from incoming particles to the side of it. Whereas the whole darkening is this rubber sleeve we have all around the tube itself. So let's see what kind of tube we actually have here. I did cut out this silicone bonding with the acrylic light collector that we saw. So, oh, it's a little it's still still fastened a bit here on these sides that's very brittle it actually just uh, rips off but you can see down here it's a Hamamatsu R 6233 so let's just uh, bring up a data sheet on that you can see here it's uh, made in China from 2009 and I actually recall that Hamamatsu is a uh, Japanese company and has been for a very long time. So it's, I think it's the first time I've seen one that says made in China. Let us take a closer look. It's really hard to see through the window, but we can make out a few details here that we can see some kind of a funneling going on. And if we take a look at the side, we can actually see the um, different connections to the dynodes. The dynodes is like a 10 level multiplier. So uh, the voltage is higher or more negative on each stage to accelerate the single proton that comes in through the window here and turn that into a electron flow, which is what we can measure. And about here, we can actually see the funnel going down here and then it just has more and more surfaces that acts kind of like mirrors. So the angle of the impact is the angle of the path away from that surface to the next one and so forth until it hits the anode where we measure the volt. The high voltage power supply connects for the tube socket and the analog amplifier seems very identical to the PMT. 12a that i have taken apart and reverse engineered earlier it has this 34 socket pin header along with a small coaxial cable so let's just put that to the side for now what i want to do is uh, actually compare this pcb here with the, the pmt 12a assembly and as you can see it is very much an identical layout they did not uh, invent something completely new we can see a lot of the whole input output and the power supply section is very identical and if we peek into the analog amplifier section here we can also see that the layout and even some of the ic names is actually the same the high voltage power supply module is changed to another one which is from a company called Yi, so not exactly a Hamamatsu that were suited up for the tube itself. So uh, let's take a closer look. Deep diving into the analog amplifier section, which is this shielded case here. We have the signal coming from the PMT tube going into this first little IC here which is a analog devices 8610A, which is a, a very low noise JFET operational amplifier. We also have two marked potentiometers here, one for offset, one for gain. The signal most likely routes up to this 
analog devices 744 IC, which is a bifed operational amplifier. Along that we have a analog devices ADG 417 switch sitting up here, which is just a single switch. So presumably used to sample some kind of signal. I'm not sure it's actually part of the signal path here that the sampling is done here, but most likely some diagnostics. Then we have two unknown JRC marked ICs here. And then just before the output plug up in the left corner, this IC here is a analog devices 817, which is a low power amplifier. And all these analog devices actually is identical to the previous design, whereas the old design had this built up with transistors in their very own circuit and design. But seems that time have caught up and analog devices had developed a very low power or very low noise amplifier they can use instead. From a service manual, which I did with the last one, I was able to find out that the whole pinout of this 34 pin header was given. Uh, just needs a little interpretation and also, yeah, I think I did trial and error to find out which pins were meant to be pulled high or low on the PMT12 board. So with the experiences from that, the pinout is almost exactly the same, except there are more plus 15 volt and minus 15 volt connectors this time, but it has the same high voltage on signal as the last time. So that means uh, most of the bottom row here is actually the ground connections, and then we have the minus 15 and plus 15 in the middle, and then we have the statuses in the left side, or the highest numbers, and most of the commands are put into the right side, at the low numbers. So um, I should actually be able to, with this small adapter I made here, to uh, be able to supply a, a ground minus 15 plus 15 volt and a high voltage on signal with plus 5 volt and we should be able to get this to run. I got the cable connected up to the board. I have my small adapter PCB sitting over here. So uh, let's start by connecting up all our different uh, voltages, supply voltages, and then measure them out on all these nice test points that we have here. So uh, at first I'm going to connect my two grounds from the 5 volt and minus, plus minus 15, that one we have here. So let's check out the large pin we have here, that's plus 5 volt, so that's for the high voltage on. Let's wait with that one. Then we have plus 15 volt, so that's the brown here. Let's hook that one up. Minus 15. So we can connect that as well. Okay. So uh, as you can see over here, the blue LED actually is turned on right now. So when we connect the minus 15, goes out again. Not quite sure what kind of mechanic that is, but now we can test out some of the voltages. We have plus 12 volts sitting down here. Yeah, minus 12 over here. Checks out good. Now else, what else do we have? We have the high voltage tab over here, should not read anything right now. Yep, so that's zero. And I think that actually makes up for all the, all the other here's our test points for the PMT output. So right now we have our voltages just present, the 5 volt to the high voltage on. And then check out the pin over here in the range of minus 6 to 700. That's what I expect from these commercial PMT assemblies. And we're getting minus 82. That might have to do with not having the tube in place. I think uh, this is uh, good enough to move on to inserting the tube and do some uh, particle detection. So let's first talk a bit about skintillation plastics. Skintillation plastics is a light emitter that can emit light when submitted to ionizing radiation. Now I have two different pieces here. 
I have a BC408 type material, which is a general purpose one. And then I have a unknown piece of material here, which is a bit larger. Now, what we're going to detect in this experiment is cosmic radiation. And it is the particles called myons or myons. These are created in the upper atmosphere uh, around Earth at about 10 kilometers height. That it is muons that we are detecting because they have a lifespan of 2.2 microseconds. And once a muon is trapped inside this scintillation material, it will stop up. And then because it is radioactively unstable, it will deteriorate into a electron. So the first part where the muon stops and the muon it has the same charge as an electron, it emits a flash of light. And then as this lifespan, when it's in rest, then it will emit the electron, which will give a second flash of light. And the span between these two flashes of light is 2.2 microseconds. So that's what we're going to see in this experiment. The PMT has been set up with the BC408 scintillation plastic material. I have shielded it with three layers of aluminum foil to shield out any light. I have my multimeter set up for the high voltage, oscilloscope set up for the signal, and then a counter for count per minute. So let's just try to fire it up. So it's running at the minus 500 volt DC, which is not so much to gain a high sensitivity on APMT. But uh, we can see that we are getting a, uh, a good signal over here. We're getting some bumps. I have inverted the signal as uh, yeah, normally it is a dipping signal from APMT. And we can also see on the count per minute up here. Let's just reset that that if it is around, is it some hundred or so, that is within normal background radiation levels. Because I'm not too sure about the trigger level, but it, it seems to, um, to trigger quite all right on what it should. Now uh, we're just getting all kinds of um, ra radiation up here. So if we go into single shot mode, we could instead be looking at what kind of different um, particles we are actually detecting because the signature of a muon is uh, quite distinctive. And that is also why I have set this up for a pulse width and period measurement uh, on the pulse time. As the muon uh, hitting the scintillation material should give the highest peak and then 2.2 microseconds later we should see a lower peak from the electron being emitted. And this is not quite steep enough, but uh, could be a muon, but uh, certainly not the signature that we are looking for right now. See, that is more like it. 2.88 microseconds. Uh, maybe I have to set my trigger level a bit higher to get these high energy particles instead. Whoa. That was uh, some uh, weird stuff we got there. Not quite sure what uh, that would be with the three decays within two microseconds. But let's just see what we get. There is also much less of those high energy particles hitting our scintillation material. So let's just try to turn down the trigger voltage. 2.9 microseconds. But this is pretty much the signature that we expect from a muon, that we have a high peak and then we have something that is one third to half lower, but within some three microseconds. I think if you look at a diagram with the distribution of lifetimes, there is a, a wide variety, but the overall standard Lifetime is 2.2 microseconds. Here we have a prime example of a muon. We have the high energy impact, we have the decay 2.28 microseconds later, and it's much nearer one third less energy than the main event. So this is a clear signature of a muon event hitting our scintillation material. 
Thank you for watching. I hope you really enjoyed the reverse engineering testing and particle detection with a photo multiplier tube. Now, I am becoming quite the collector of PMTs as I mentioned, I also have the PMT-12A assembly from Fujifilm, where this is the PMT-26A. But I also did a much more thorough reverse engineering of a AGFA um, IOP-16 or 32 assembly of a PMT here. And you can find the schematics on my website, as this has much more detail, as this was easier to reverse engineer, as it was not as SMD based and integrated as these newer Fujifilm units are. So you can learn a lot more from the older circuit as it is basically the same circuit being used in all PMT assemblies, but this was easier to identify and draw up a schematic. So I hope this inspired you to get hold of a PMT if you can. These are easy to buy on eBay and not that expensive and makes for a perfect do-it-yourself particle detection project. You can do all kinds of uh, radioactive ionizing radiation experiments with household items because you can you just use whatever radiation we have from the space or from the ground below us. And if you're really into coding and building stuff with microcontrollers, FPGAs and such, you can build up your own microcontroller to do spectrography. So you can actually identify what kind of particles you are detecting by analyzing on the waveforms. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. See ya.